to welcome you all to the last day of Web Visions 2010, the 10th anniversary of Web Visions. Oh, look, I have a camera. I'm actually welcoming the stream. You guys. Hi, you guys. Welcome to Web Visions 2010. Good morning. It's early, right? I don't know what you're doing on the computer so early. Maybe you should be working instead. I'm not sure. But you're here, and you're with us, and that's fantastic. Thank you for joining us. And now I'm going to tell these people something, so you just wait a second. Uh, I've been asked to tell you that one of the special things happening today, Friday, at Web Visions is that there's going to be an, a book signing out in the lobby directly after this first round of uh, sessions. So if you have books you want to get signed, you want to go out there, they've got some of the, the speakers out there with their books, it's going to be a lovely time. Go and join them for that, but wait until we're done here, because we've got stuff to talk about. Okay? All right. Now we're going to start. That was the, you know, that's the early stuff. Now we have a panel. I'm Cammie Chaos, and I'm moderating the panel with Alex Williams. Hello. I don't think Alex's mic is working very well. It's not. <clears throat> but this is Alex Williams. Uh, he currently writes for the Read Write Web, uh, formerly of Podcast Hotel, although he still does a little bit with that. And he's going to be uh, moderating the online portion of this panel. This is a panel about podcasting old and where it's moving into. And for that panel, I brought three guys with some very, very distinct um, and very interesting uh, characteristics. We've got Josh Bancroft, and Josh comes from just the very old school podcasting background with, you know, sitting around in front of his computer doing unboxing. I'll let him tell you a little more. Um, but he also now works for Intel Software Network TV. Did I get it right? You did. Very good. Oh, Thank you. Fantastic. And then we've got Robert Wagner, and Robert Wagner has a, a station, as it were, online called pdx.fm uh, that has really taken a transitional approach from what we used to find as entertainment, audio entertainment, and brought it up to date. And then we've got Aaron Weiss. Aaron works for KGW, he's a producer there. And instead of just letting things go by the wayside uh, and, and be what traditional media, traditional television is supposed to be, Aaron's really bringing things up to date, and I thought his perspective would be incredibly valuable. Hi, guys. Good morning. Hi. I think we're going to start with Josh, um, because you go the furthest back in podcast. I started in November 2004, yeah. and uh, there's a, a funny story I tell at meetups and conferences about how experimentally I was, there was a service called Audio Blogger that would let you call a phone number, and it would let you record what you were doing and then post it to your blogger.com blog. And I thought, that would be cool. I'll play with it. And there's this story, and I, I won't tell you if it's apocryphal or not, um, <laughs> of the first podcast I ever made was a phone call that... Um, I may or may not have been using the restroom at the time, so that was my, uh, uh, and again, I'm not saying if that's true or not, uh, but, it's but the, rumor. that's the story of my beginning in podcasting. Okay, so coming from the very early, maybe bathroom stages of podcasting, how did we transition from that and from unboxing to where we are today and where you are today? Um, I've always been kind of uh, someone, someone who likes to live on the experimental edge of what the internet can do for media and for communication and collaboration, which is what drew me to blogging, it's what drew me to podcasting, and, and I've always tried to stay on the, um, the evolving edge of that, and so it happened through you know, doing a regular podcast on my blog for a couple of years about gadgets and PDAs and geek toys, um, to trying to evangelize and really kind of get podcasting to take root inside the workplace, um, where I work, which is at Intel. Um, with some successes and some failures, but I'm always kind of experimentally trying things and lots of them fail just by their experimental nature. Uh, but the last one that has really kind of taken off and been a success was Intel Software Network TV, which is weekly live broadcasts on topics that interest software developers. Um, but we also do a lot of traditional podcasting behind that. We take the recordings, um, they're video, but we do audio versions as well. We put them up. There's a feed that you can subscribe to. We're in the iTunes podcast directory. 
so it's it's been kind of something that's almost like nature to me that I just do because I like it. And I've been fortunate enough to be able, be able to apply that in my work life as well. So I guess that's how I got where I am today. And what do you think? That, that sounded all big and efficient, where I am today. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. From the peak of achievement. So what do you think of podcasting in general, though? I mean, where do you think... From, the, from its early stages, do you, th do you think that there's still a lot of guys sitting in the bathroom or not, sitting behind their desk making that <laughs> phone call to record? I, I, mean, think, I think their entire site's dedicated to that now. <laughs> um, I, I think the future of podcasting is probably the future of media. Um, the same way that blogging kind of went through this period where people were doing a lot of introspection and saying, you know, is, blog is blogging journalism and is it, is it real? And I think we're getting out of that now to where it's just kind of accepted and you know when I think of media outlets I think of sites like Read Write Web and Engadget just as much or maybe even before I think of um, what you would consider you know old school journalistic sites like the New York Times or Reuters or something like that so I think the same thing is going to happen with podcasting where um, you know the, it's, it's the future of media not so much the future of you know the way you release an audio file in an RSS feed but the way you create media to talk to people and, and get people interested in what you have to say, whether it's from your bathroom or from the set of a TV station. Aaron? I, I totally on the same page with Josh. Um, you know, without, I guess we'll bust out the, the C word, convergence, you're, you're ending up with the folks who are recording podcasts in their in their bathrooms uh, or their closets because or their basement the audio is better <laughs> yeah uh, and at the end of the day everyone's going to the you're up uploading your podcast to the same place whether it's iTunes or uh, or Google's upcoming market and you're up there competing for the same eyeballs and and ears as the big guys and as the the networks start moving into podcasting uh, or or narrowcasting, at the end of the day, what's the difference between a, a podcast recorded in your basement and the different and an episode of The Office that you can download from the iTunes Music Store? Nothing. It's, it's a digital file. You play it on the device of your choice and, and you listen to it. Um, and so we're all, everyone's ending up in the same sandbox. And that that's the fun part, is getting to see how all this shakes out. I, I think that flows really well nicely into something that I wanted to address Robert specifically. What Robert has done is he's taken what some would consider a failing of old media um, and the, you know, your access to it and the, what is delivered with it and created something completely new. So how do you feel, Robert, about, uh, about what they've just said about the, that it's the same thing that's being delivered? Because we don't actually call your shows podcasts. It's, it's, Right. Yeah, they're shows. That's a dirty word with Robert. We'll just yeah. pretend it's not a podcasting yeah. panel for a moment. So podcasting is, uh, yeah, ties it too directly to a device. But no, I, I think that um, the internet itself is the magic right here where if somebody over here who's made a dancing baby video and these people over here made a laughing baby video and more people are watching that in any given week than an episode of, you know, whatever TV show mm -hmm. is popular at that time, which is happening each and every day, yeah. then yeah, we've, it's, by accident, nobody saw it coming, they, it's created an environment where my form of entertainment is just as viable as your form of entertainment, and that applies to information, education, all across the board. Mm -hmm. So I, I would agree, it's, podcasting is basically leveling that playing field much like the internet itself, it's just an added layer of it, where the internet leveled who could get information out there, podcasting has leveled what people can deliver in terms of all those different categories of programming or media or whatever you want to call it. So the, is the problem then with, with podcasting that in old media we still have a revenue model? I mean, it's, it's not as strong as it used to be because we used to very much be tied to our televisions and tied to our radio and if we wanted that entertainment, we either had to go and buy a DVD or a VCR tape or whatever CD, uh, but now uh, content on the web is so free, does it make it more difficult for uh, the quality of show that we would otherwise produce? I think as long as you have people who are willing to stick with it. I've never thought that it's the revenue model that's the problem with podcasting and monetizing anything, be it blogs or podcasts. I think it's more that you have a couple generations of people who don't know of it yet. Yeah. And who aren't those of us who are out there already doing it 
ahead of the curve, so to speak. I mean, and it's going to take them a while to catch up. I think that once you have that mass audience directing their attention to all these things that are be already being done, that we've been doing for years in some cases, then revenue will naturally follow. So I think my question for that then is, are the early adopters kind of punished in a way because you oh, sure. spend, you know, you, you're going to pour so much, you know, years of your heart and soul into it. You're not having anything aside from positive feedback from the few people who are appreciating what's going on currently. Well, it's, it's technology. Early adopters are always punished. <laughs> That's, there's no getting around that. Yeah. You know, I, I give you my first generation iPhone or my, you know, whatever it might be. I mean, there's, there's always more later, more audience more power, more information, whatever it would be, depending on what you're talking about. Technology just works that way. Yeah. You know, those of us who are the first to jump in the pool, well, we don't get to have all the fun when everybody jumps in the pool. You know, we were there first, and we could tell you if the water was hot or cold, but ultimately the party happens when everybody's in the pool with you. Mm -hmm. I like swimming in the pool when there's not a lot of people around. I can't swim. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, bad. That was bad. Was a bad analogy. <laughs> I like that's, swimming. That's where the I metaphor just don't like a lot down. of people yeah. around. And, and I think that ties into something I think about a lot and, and talk about people who do things as an amateur, meaning one who does it for the love. Mm -hmm. I think early adopters do it, they're driven because of the love of what they do. They're, but it's not necessarily an amateur level in which they do it. Right, and amateur, not meaning amateur in the sense that it's lower quality, but okay. amateur meaning I'm not doing this because I'm getting paid to do this. Correct. Meaning I'm doing it because I think it's awesome and I love to play with it, and I think that's what drives a lot of the early adopters and then other people come along. I mean, I think of the podcasts I listen to most um, and, you know, in the top ten, probably half of them are produced by what would be considered traditional media organizations, mostly NPR, um, you know, stuff like This American Life and the other stuff mm -hmm. that I think is great content. And it doesn't matter so much whether we call it a podcast or a radio show or But the, or most whatever. of those are produced as radio shows and released as podcasts. But they, but the, the boundary starts to blur. It does. I agree. Um, so how does that model figure into what you're doing at Intel then? Because you guys aren't producing at all. It's not an amateur thing because you're doing it for a corporation, but you're certainly not doing it as, as uh, you know, profitable. You're doing it as inter inter edutainment, maybe? That's maybe a good way to describe it. Um, so what we do is, is actually part of our, our charter. The group that I'm in is the developer relations group in the software part of Intel. So everything that we do and our reason for existing is for reaching out and talking to software developers and helping them make better software because we exist. Helping them know about the tools that we make or, or techniques or experts that they might be able to take advantage of. So that's the reason we have a website. That's the reason we have blogs and forums and the other things we do. And that's the reason we do Intel Software Network TV is because it's a way that helps us build that community and get information into people's hands. So you're right, it's not amateur in the sense that we're doing it for the love of it, um, but it's not like we're doing it to make money either. And I think there's, a, there, there's room for all of those. There's room for people who are doing it because that's their day job and they need to pay the rent, and there's room for people who are just the geeks that are doing it for the love and, and everything in between. I want to pull Alex in. Oh, go ahead, Aaron. Sorry. I, I just wanted to say that I think in the old media, there's a, a lot of the, that same thinking going on that it's not at this point about a revenue generator but it is about loyalty and buy-in from your audience and bringing in an audience who you wouldn't have loyalty otherwise. Is a really, really and the revenue will follow once there's a critical mass of audience there but in the meantime there are a lot of things that that it does in terms of boosting and supporting your revenue generator right now mm -hmm. until such time as, as the podcasts and, and the new media stuff is is driving the bottom line as opposed to right now just supplementing it a, a small bit. And, and I think adding on to that, I think the real challenge fundamentally is the scarcity of people's attention. I mean, when you were a Short attention span TV, TV channel, TV well, not even necessarily the attention span, but just the glut of, of stuff that's out there. 24 hours You know, when day. there were 500 TV channels, nobody could figure out what to watch, yeah. and now there are a million or however many yeah, millions of, of podcasts. How are you going to capture an audience and get people who are really loyal? I think that is the big challenge, because if your other goals are revenue or conversions or whatever they are, and building that audience and getting that attention is, is what has to happen first. Because most podcasters are not brand strategists. Exactly. <laughs> I wanted to pull Alex in for a minute because we were talking about um, early adapters, early adopters, and, and, you know, kind of, Alex is not, you're not really doing much with podcasting anymore, but you were. From a yeah. Uh, no, I'm not really doing a lot of podcasting now. 
I did podcasting events, and I, I, I use it as a as a reporting medium, but also as a uh, a medium for um, uh, events. And I thought it was, you know, it's it's a it's a great medium for events to be able to record events and have them in archive. Yeah. And what, was it just the you know why why was it that you kind of slowed down on it? Because I haven't. Oh, why did I slow down on it? Yeah. <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, I, I really started getting more into video, so I was doing more video. Yeah. Um, and I was using you know, video for you know for community management purposes. So you know, I you know I think that's kind of like you know a, uh, a what I what I started to see was podcasting was becoming so distributed, mm -hmm. and that really you could distribute a, a blog, a, an audio file, a video file via RSS in any number of ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of felt like I was just kind of, you know, I was, I was becoming much more distributed in how I was using the medium uh, more than anything else. Um, and so that's really essentially it. And, you know, and, and I, you know, I, think, I think podcasting is something that just has, had a, has a, had a real catalyst effect on a lot of technologies. And now my interest more is in how uh, the cloud is affecting uh, podcasting, how it's changing. It seems like there's a lot of uh, changes going on right now that are affecting podcasting in a really good way. Uh, the costs are getting lower. Um, the distribution is much different. And so that's really what you know, my greatest interest is right now. I'm, I'm curious what you guys think about you know, how the cloud affects podcasting, how social networks affect podcasting, and how that affects um, your ability to, to use it and to maximize on it. On our end, as far as how the, the cloud affects us, you know, I, most traditional media aren't running their own servers anyway these days. They've, they are, they've realized that's not their, their core strength, and there are, uh, there are companies that do that better and that are better to, to work with and, and to bring on board. Um, and I think, I, I'm not even sure if our, like at KGW, if our upstream uh, partners, uh, Broadcast Interactive Media, uh, if they're entirely self-hosted or they're working through folks like uh, Amazon S3, things like that. Um, but I think that that level of abstraction makes it so much easier for new players to get into the space because you don't have to make that that hardware investment. That you can, you know, you could have a couple guys in the basement come up with a decent competitor to, to broadcast interactive media without having to make that, that giant server farm investment to make it happen. Right. I, from, from my perspective, that's exciting to see what comes down the pipe um, that, that makes my job easier. Right. right. Because we're really, you know, two, two companies detached from, from the actual cloud itself. Mm -hmm. Aaron, what do you do? So, aside from the the standard production that you guys do on TV, you guys also produce a back stream, a back channel, um, because Live at Seven is streamed. Live at Seven is streamed, and so is the production booth. Yeah, the production booth is streamed. It's actually that it's not podcasted or archived. Um, no, but it's still live. I mean, you know, podcasting, live. live streaming, all these different ways of. I want to just anything that any way of delivering the content on the net. I yeah. Think is, um, and the. The, you know, the live stream is, is, is something that we, we've discovered we are, we're getting viewers uh, from across the country who are watching online. Um, even though we're, we don't have a particularly national bent, we, we see those folks showing up in the chat room and, and sending us email. Um, and it's, it's good to know that a local product can still find, even if a small audience, um, across the country. And the back channel is... Uh, is one of those things I think you're going to start seeing a lot more, a uh, lot more mainstream media doing. Uh, mm -hmm. John King's new show on CNN. I was amazed the other day when I looked up. They were in an ad, and they had a little box in the corner with a live camera on the set, on screen during the ads. I'm like, well, hey, someone CNN's been watching live at seven. <laughs> you, you've inspired lots of people. That's something we do with Intel Software Network TV. Um, before and after we actually start a show, we run a a webcam that's live, you know, on the behind the scenes setup. And we don't record it, we don't archive it, it's basically there. And I think one of the main purposes it serves is it's fun. Mm -hmm. You know, people get to see us mess up and screw things up or scramble last minute to get something going. And, and that fun is something that goes a long way to, um, to building that, 
you know, that, that connection with, with your listeners, with your audience or your watchers, um, to, to build that, um, that community and that connection. Um, it's also something I notice now that we've been producing a lot more video, I've been watching TV and other shows with kind of a more critical eye, and I notice that the shows that I really like, um, there's lots of reasons I like them, but one of the reasons, like on Mythbusters or Dirty Jobs, is that they don't, it's, they're not afraid to show the, the behind the scenes stuff. The, you know, they'll be filming the star doing something and then they'll cut to something funny that the cameraman did as he tri tripped over something or fell in a crevasse or something. Um, and, and I really like that. I think breaking down the wall, like whatever they, the fourth wall they call it, mm -hmm. um, it really just goes a long way to humanizing what you're doing. It, it's what creates a connection. And that, and that I think is, is the key as all of this get, gets more distributed, you have so many more options, creating that veneer of this is just the TV show and it doesn't exist in the in other universe, or this is just the person reading the news, yeah. Ron so Burgundy style. We're, it, we're, it doesn't fly anymore. anymore. We're just a bunch of humans. And yeah. like it takes the clue train it from, says. from being entertained to voyeurism, though. I, I, I look at it more in, the, in the, the clue train manifesto kind of sort of way, that people recognize each other through their human voice and precisely because of their humanity and their, their mistakes and their you know, authenticity, I guess. So. Mm -hmm. I yeah, mean, it's, voyeurism, it's, I guess, is one way to put it. It's actual people doing this. Yeah. Go figure. Well, it's not just that I mean, one there's guy. a difference between watching something that's staged and set up. I mean, the whole thing with reality TV, which, which baffles me, and I can never really quite understand it because it's not reality, but mm -hmm. it is the, it's, the, it's the voyeuristic tendencies in all humans to sit and people watch and to watch what's going on and to see what's happening. And I think, to a large extent, the podcasting, more than the podcasting, but the setup before uh, the booth camera and uh, Dr. Normal when he does Strange of Live, because I like things to start on time and they don't always. The, the solution was we turn the camera on yeah. and we let everyone watch us set up. And I think people might like watching us set up more than they like the actual show because it's funny and it's entertaining to see what actually goes into stuff. But it is voyeurism. I mean, you're, you're getting a glimpse into something that you wouldn't normally get a chance to look at. It's even things like DVD commentary. Yeah. Which is basically a podcast. I yeah. mean, you, you stick a director in an audio booth, have him talk for an hour and a half during the movie, stick it on a DVD. I, I can't imagine 20 years ago people wanting to buy an extra VHS tape that also included a director telling you all about, you know, uh, an Eddie Murphy movie. But nowadays, <laughs> it's expected. That's Eddie Murphy, that's and, Eddie Murphy. And that Eddie glimpse Murphy, behind the Eddie scenes Murphy. of what went into the making the movie yeah. um, is, is part of our expectation now in the movie going experience. We uh, do have some questions coming in online, um, so I'd like to pose this to you guys. Uh, Peter Woolley is asking, what's the average monthly bandwidth cost for a popular podcast? And he's thinking in particular of Strange Love Live. Cammy Chaos is in no way qualified to answer questions. I think we should just open mics, Mike. And <laughs> I, uh, might be able to, I might be able to get someone to whisper that in Mike? my ear, but I don't know. Dr. Normal? Do you guys I have actually, any answers? Where's, where's our behind the scenes cam? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You can just Someone swing that, that camera, camera two around there. Point at Dr. Normal, please. <laughs> Hand signals will work, we'll, too. We'll get that going. That, <laughs> that question will get answered in a little bit. I think we're getting a zero from the back. <laughs> um, I, I, I think the, the, the bigger lesson there is that those costs are trending towards zero. As you have you know, mm -hmm. folks like Google announcing their, their cloud services mm -hmm. and Amazon, you're going to get downward pricing pressure. I mean, what Google's announcement for their, their bandwidth costs is something like 15 cents a gig. Uh, so extrapolate out from there if you're hosting a you know, 40 meg podcast, what's it going to cost you if you end up with you know, 40,000 downloads a month? It's nothing. It's minimal. Yeah. 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 Robert, you produce so many shows. What's, what's the bandwidth look like for that? How many shows uh, between the two channels, um, uh, FM and AM, do you? There's over 40 now, and, if and I remember right. Yeah, what's the bandwidth look like that, for that? Um, it runs like, about, take your most popular show. I know the combined total, because I know what the bill is. Okay, there you um, go. It's usually about $3,500 a month. Yeah, I mean, that's quite a bit. So yeah, if we can get to zero, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> If you could make a phone call and help make that, that happen, out. <laughs> petition yeah. anything. And if you're hugely successful, I think, I mean, if you're just starting out podcasting, then you're not getting that much bandwidth. Right. So as you build success, hopefully you're being able to, you know, get advertisers or other ways to, to offset that and not go broke. 
Does everyone know the hashtag if you want to ask a question from Alex, either in the stream or you're out there somewhere and you don't want to raise your hand? Uh, it's just WV. WV 2010. Oh, 2010. And Alex right. is checking the, the Twitter stream. And we actually, yeah, we have, a, have another question. I, I got one last night from uh, Marshall uh, Kirkpatrick, Hi, Marshall. who was uh, wondering um, what you guys think of tools like Cinch and Huffduffer, and what are some of the, uh, of the new tools that you guys really like. Josh, you were mentioning one that you use at uh, Powell's when you heard Cory Doctorow. Yeah, I, I experiment with a lot of those. I think um, Cinch, which is a service from Blog Talk Radio that lets you either call a phone number or use an app on your smartphone uh, to do a quick audio recording and then publish that really quickly. I love those. I think they're awesome. Um, I, I don't have the discipline to use them regularly because I'm kind of an experimentalist, but um, they're fantastic tools and, and most of the time they're free and they're really easy to use. Um, when I was at, uh, I was at a, a book reading last weekend at Powell's for Cory Doctorow, who's one of my favorite authors. Um, I sat down and, and just before the reading, I, I hadn't planned to do this, but I thought it would be really cool if I could record the audio of this and then post it later as a podcast. So I got out my iPad, um, and yes, the irony of using my iPad at the Cory Doctorow event is not lost on me, um, and, and downloaded a, a program which I've used before, um, I think it's Griffin's iTalk. Um, there's tons of recording apps for any device that you have. Um, and I used that to record the audio and then edit it, you know, chopped it up a little bit on my computer using free tools. Um, I want to plug a tool called Levelator. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this conversation will ever get into the techie realm, but um, that is a fantastic free tool that does a great job of just smoothing out the audio and your levels. Just go try it. It's, it's magic. Um, but I ran it through that and then I uploaded it to I post my videos, my personal stuff on Blip TV, which is a free service, um, and it automatically sideload that file to the Internet Archive at archive.org, which is also a free service. And then I took it and posted it on my blog, which you know I pay for my blog, but your blog could also be free. So there's not necessarily any cost involved in any of that. There's a lot of great free tools, whether it's the the automated ones like Cinch, or if you like to kind of uh, mix and match the other stuff that's available. Um, I, I love the the breadth of tools that's available out there. The one that continues to impress me is uh, Livestream, formerly known as Mogulus, mm -hmm. which is essentially a, a TV studio in your web browser. Um, it's crazy impressive, the stuff that they've managed you need to include a in a mic there. and a webcam. Yeah, a, a mic and a webcam, and more importantly, multiple webcams and a whole bunch of queued up YouTube videos, and you really could produce a full TV show for zero cost, because if you're willing to let them stick ads over your stream, mm -hmm. it is totally free. You could be totally distributed with a bunch of webcams all across the country or, right. or the world. Right. Have your you, have you, your tapes queued up, and it is a, and they've got lower thirds and full screens and and everything, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's a very impressive tool. And and you can even scale that up. Um, we actually use Livestream.com. Um, not applying uh, implying any official endorsement, but. Um, I think that's, that's where we're being streamed right now. So. That's the service oh. we use um, for Intel Software Network TV. And we have you know, multiple cameras, and we use a TriCaster, and we do our own graphics and, and, and thirds and stuff. But we use, the, we use Livestream to, to get that out there and to track what, people, you know, what our viewer minutes are and how many people are watching and that sort of stuff. That's another great service. The free option is terrific. Yeah. TriCaster being the other just awesome tool for the money. Yeah, a TriCaster is a very, very cool toy. But you have to be willing to you have to be willing to shell out some money and yeah. and the time I mean, actually the the no educational entry I mean you can sit down with TriCaster for five minutes and be fully confident to switch it because I've been forced to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, so if I could do it, anyone can. But you have to shell out even for the even for the entry level model. About you have to shell grand. out. Yeah, I think it's thirty five hundred four thousand for like. But and then but you don't want to hook up a web camera you, if you're going to shop the money for a tricaster. Then you're you, buying some cameras and some microphones correct. and you're, yeah. you're so getting a little more serious at that point. Up. But yeah. but you can do you can do a ton with webcams and free services. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the portable devices are are have, have become so of such high quality too, haven't they? You know, or the, the portable recording. You you must use those in your work. We well, you're doing video. So. We're doing video, um, and so we're still primarily on the the big old uh, Beta SX cameras from Sony. We are finally about to roll out our first solid state cameras. We, as a station, decided to go with again the broadcast quality Sony's, um, not because of any big difference in image quality, but because uh, of durability concerns. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. they're out there in the field, in the rain, um, and right. you can go with the EX1s or EX3s, but then it's kind of a toilet paper roll situation, and you're always okay. shuttling them back into the shop. Uh, Alex, Dr. Normal says we've got some questions out there. I don't see Okay, them. great. Let me uh, if you bring want to the mic head out. out. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have a question for Alex, go ahead and raise your hand, and he'll be over to you in a, in a moment. Not, not all at once. Oh, okay. <laughs> Here we are. The vast audience. You must wait your I'm turn gonna, to raise your hand. I'm not going to break my leg hand. doing this. Okay. Safety first, Alex. Here you go. Um, one of the things that happens with production and stuff is that it, the editing and actual, you know, producing of it is like a drain clogger. Mm -hmm. This is where it slows down. What tools are you using or wish, do you wish were out there that would help streamline that process instead of resorting to, well, let's just let it go live and, I mean, you know, raw and, and deliver it that give you some creative control over it before you shoot it out? Uh, I have a really quick answer because we discussed it earlier. We, we do stream our shows live, but he uses the, Dr. Norman uses the TriCaster to go ahead and edit everything as it's going to switch the cameras and to do the lower thirds. And there's uh, great tools in there to edit, uh, do post-production on, on that as well. And so TriCaster, if, if you're willing to shout the money for that, he used some other stuff beforehand, uh, just uh, software that comes with, the, with your computer that you can download for relatively cheap. Uh, but it was a lot more time consuming. And I think I, I would agree with that. And it wouldn't even necessarily take an expensive tool like a TriCaster, but I think just the, the mindset or maybe forcing yourself to do it live. Um, I know with our production stuff, we do very little post-production and editing because we, we make sure that we've got mechanisms in place to put up a graphic on screen when somebody's talking or because we're doing it live, we want it to look good live. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we put that, that means we put all the work in on the front end to produce it and, and then when we're done, we have a very polished, almost ready product that usually all we have to do is chop the ends off and compress it and upload it. You, you could do it with you could do it with other tools. I mean, you yeah. can get creative with um, you know with a VGA switcher and uh, you know an iPhone or, mm -hmm. or something like that. There's there's I think if you just take the mindset of um, what I'm producing needs to go out in the state that I want it to be in, and then get creative about ways to make that happen. Also, when you're when you're done recording, you don't have a lot of editing to do. Yeah. It really kills that. When when we first started, started doing Strange of Live, it was the uh, one hour show, and then literally 48 hour, a full weekend of getting everything edited and ready to go, and it was a nightmare. It was it literally it caused all sorts of problems, uh, both uh, with the podcast and in our personal lives. And most podcasters are not doing that for a living, so that's a real uh, that's a real something to look at. I'm yeah. curious, the Robert, it, what's the and Aaron as well. What's the audio side of that? Because Josh and I both have. You know, when we first started, we um, we were using a full Pro Tools setup uh -huh. that was it was like 32 tracks, I think, and a you know, full automated board and the whole bit. And we would then have to take that those tracks and bounce them to disk, make an MP3. And we realized that all we were really doing was just creating more work for ourselves. We weren't actually, you know, the, the people who were heard alive and because that became an increasing number, they were going to hear what they were going to hear anyway. I mean, they're not going to hear the, the final version that you just spent three hours cutting up and making perfect or, you know, as close to it as possible. We realized, why not just make all of that, you know, on the audio and analog, record it to two-track and you're done. Mm -hmm. Rather than, you know, because ultimately, it's interesting, we were talking about, you know, amateur this and amateur that. One of the things that I think people like about some of what we do is when we make mistakes, they actually enjoy that quite a bit, and they're looking out for it because it's it's more of a. It makes them feel like, hey, we're we're part of this cutting edge thing too. You know, we're right here with you. We're early adopters now, yep. and we find that you know, hey, that cut our workflow down you know significantly. Rather than you know, we would have a half hour podcast that we in turn you know, ooh, something bad happened. We'd spend three hours worrying about that, getting it to a final MP3, and for what? You know, just to have fixed a few things that ultimately people had an appreciation for or understood anyway. The big thing, I think, even in a situation where you are doing something that's entirely pre-produced and not live, is don't shoot or record anything more than you need to. Um, there's a tendency, especially when you're starting out, to record everything, because you might need that later. And that is the easiest way to end up in a situation where you're overwhelmed when it comes time to edit. 
Um, go in there, if, if it's scripted, go in there with a script. If it's not scripted, go in there with a solid rundown knowing what your elements are going to be. And if you're shooting video, don't shoot, uh, you can go to uh, Mike Rosenblum and, and learn his technique and everything, but it basically comes down to shoot everything from five different angles, 10 seconds each. So every shot, you don't end up with any more than 50 seconds worth of video. And when, then you, when it comes time to do your final edit, you know that you don't have gobs of stuff to wade through that you're not going to care about later because you went in prepared and you're left with a really manageable uh, amount of raw material to, to work on your edit with. And I think that's the mistake most people make when they're, when they're starting out. Um, and then getting to what, what Josh said, the, the self-discipline of you have your deadline and this is when it's going to air. I mean, I, in my case, that is imposed on me by my employer. <laughs> 6 30 comes around, the light goes on, we're going. So if I'm not ready, that's, yeah, it's not an option. Um, and I think getting in that mindset, even if you don't have a light going on, say to yourself, this is my deadline. I will have it posted and edited by this, this time. And it, you, you front load some stress, but it, it makes it so much easier to, to, to not have to worry, am I going to go all night on this edit? Alex, you want to grab another yeah, question? Yeah, I have some questions in the, from the audience, okay. I'm all for the nobility of doing things for the love of it, but it would be nice to make a, a paycheck off a lot of this stuff as well. Um, I think specifically for Robert, when you said that the, you know, when the audience shows up, there will be revenue. With things like PDX sucks or RPDX or, or these things that you're doing, how, how close are you to that? You know, I mean, are you getting there? Is there? Do you have some kind of business model in mind for these things? Actually, currently we're very, very close. I'd say we're 90% of the way there to breaking even, <laughs> um, which when the goal was just breaking even, we're, we're happy about that. Um, as Interestingly enough, this year has accelerated that quite a bit. I mean, we started the year maybe 20% of the way there. So to have come that far just between January 1st and now is a pretty big deal. Um, we actually, I'd like to think in a best case scenario, I'll actually be making money after, you know, it's, you know there's, there's employees and things like that too. So after that's taken care of rather than coming out of my pocket, I don't think it's too far away. I, I would honestly say my best guess sometime around September. But I mean, it's taken a good, um, be about almost two years at that point. That, you know, since we were actually starting with it conceptually, actually making PDX.fm last September. So it's it's been a long road. I mean, it's not something you can do with no money. At least not on the scale that we've been trying to do it. But yeah, we're very close. I'm curious about as far as your business model. Is it sponsorships? Is it ads in program? I mean, what are you aiming at? And and at what point do you start bringing in the full time? sales folks to try and, and boost the revenue? We're this close to full-time sales folks. Okay. Um, right now, we're starting to bring in sponsors, starting to bring in ads all the time. There are certain shows that are paid shows because they're run by corporations or they're um, whole shows sponsored by you know groups, organizations, things like that, some nonprofits. So it, just, it depends a, a great deal on the show. I, some of the, uh, the more informational stuff finances the entertainment stuff. And the idea was is to get that going long enough where the entertainment stuff could attract enough attention to then bring in revenue from ads and things like that, sponsorships. Nothing too intrusive was, was the goal. You didn't want it to be like traditional radio where you're listening to like three minutes of ads for every... No. Yeah. No, and, and ultimately we'd prefer, because we're trying to be as local as possible, we'd prefer it was things that we actually used or mm -hmm. places we actually went and ate or... The old know. cigarette model on the TV. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Not that I'm not condoning cigarettes. smoking. Smoking is bad for you. You shouldn't do it. But th that's what everyone remembers. You see the TV and the guy with the cool cigarette and, you know, and his perfect hair and he's standing with the table. And then that's what advertising used to be. Nine out of ten doctors. <laughs> <laughs> Nine out of ten doctors say this isn't, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have another question? Any other questions, folks? Okay. Okay, the one thing I love about podcasting is the fact that it is new media, new media means groundbreaking. So as much as you have early adopters, it's groundbreaking. And yet I'm hearing it go back to traditional. Podcasting has to, you know, I think, I'm prejudiced, 
But I think Are it you needs to about audio or I'm, video or both. Just okay, video. both the whole the whole industry of it. It needs to break some rules, and I and so I'd like to challenge each of you to address that issue. How do you compete now that traditional is coming into the market? Does that mean you go back to traditional methodology for monetization and production, and you know, you know, nine minute segments and then an ad kind of thing, or what do you really see is going to be the future that can be rule breaking? I think one of the biggest rule breaking things with podcasting, and it's something that um, we kind of struggle with sometimes because one of our podcasts. Uh, after the fact, months later, it then gets put on um, uh, cable access, uh, is that there's no FCC to deal with. You can say whatever you want to whenever you want to. You can, you know, you can run around naked, you know, with peanut butter all over your head, screaming the F word repeatedly, and no one's going to say anything. I don't know if they're going to watch it or not, but you can do whatever you want to because it's a podcast. I saw that episode that you guys did. <laughs> that was, good, that was right? great. It was awesome. very popular. We <laughs> chat room was really active that night. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think that is one of those things, and, and that people don't necessarily like everything that they're handed to be overly edited. Uh, it goes back to the people like to see mistakes, people like to see things happening. Uh, and so you really have the opportunity to be A, be human, and B, uh, not have to censor yourself. We have a question? I, oh, and unless you want to Oh, I was just going to say, I, I'm trying to think of what rules we break with Intel Software Network TV, and it's, uh, maybe I've lived in the corporate world too long. it's corporate. But, Every Tuesday morning at 6 o'clock a.m., we go and set up a broadcast studio in our cubicles at, in the belly of a giant corporation, and we go and broadcast out to the world, and it's, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's not edgy like, to everybody. Do you feel like but, you're cheating at work? Do you feel like you should be getting your work done, but really <laughs> podcasting? Um, sometimes, yeah, because we have a lot of fun doing it, but it, it also has kind of a, almost a little bit of a pirate radio feel. You, you know, we set up this broadcast inside the belly of Intel, and... We're bringing you this information, and really, it's you know, it's official program. It's part of our, part of our community. But it started out that way. It started out, you know, hey, we're going to do these, these broadcasts. So, I mean, the other thing I was thinking of is is an example from from a book I just read. Not to mention Cory Doctorow twice in a, in a session. <laughs> Do you have um, a little man crush. A little bit, yeah. If you followed my tweets last weekend, <laughs> you, you knew that. Um, I did know that, yeah. <laughs> but uh, in his in his latest book, For the Win, which is a book about gold farmers and and how they kind of come together and form uh, basically labor unions. Uh, one of the main features, an important part of it, is, is a podcaster in, in China, in the, 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 the Pearl River Delta region, who has an audience of factory workers, of the people who work in the electronics factories and everything. And you know, she gets to the point where she has you know an audience of 10 million people, and there's an awful lot of power there. So um, they were able to break some rules in that story, and that's completely fictional. But I, I think that's a good reminder. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I get complacent sometimes and don't think about how we can push it and, and, and break some rules sometimes. So that's, that's good to think about. In the, the traditional old school corporate media world, I, th I think the challenge is figuring out how far you can go asking forgiveness rather than permission. Things like the, the, the back channel, the, the booth camera, yeah. is something that I don't know if I'd sent that up the flagpole, would have, anyone <laughs> would have ever said, oh yeah, great idea. Go ahead, Aaron. We just kind of started doing it. Yeah. Um, and we did that for a while, and then we started putting the booth camera on the air occasionally as well. Yes. Um, and I, that's something that I, I don't, I figured it was safe enough that if someone really didn't like it, they would just tell me to stop, but I wouldn't get fired for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that becomes the challenge to figure out how far you can push things and then have someone say, boy, that was a really brilliant idea you had there. Uh, you should do a little more of that. And helping, the, helping pushing, dragging uh, the folks <laughs> along who wouldn't necessarily think that this is a good idea to lift back the curtain that much, then once you actually do it, they, they realize, oh yeah, this is beneficial. And that's, that's the, big, the big challenge. I think probably the single biggest way we've tried to push anything forward is inviting the audience to have a big part in what we mm. do. More that um, at any given time, we've, we've had shows where, you know, for, for whatever reason, you know, the rest of life gets in the way or you just didn't have time or somebody was sick, you'll come in and have almost nothing to discuss for a solid hour. And we've been able to, time and time again, rely on our audience to come in through chat, through Twitter, through email, and give us topics or argue points with us or make jokes or do any number of things that traditional media hasn't had. And you're seeing more and more of it all the time with you know the, the voting system on, on American Idol and things like that, but they're not approaching 
individuals. It's just like a, you know, text this to vote this, text that to vote that, which is only so much. Uh, except that KGW, the square, does very much the same thing uh, with the uh, Twitter responses. They oh, right. have, yeah. they have yeah. the, is it the hot box, I can't remember what it's called. It's the question yeah. that it, they it send out. It changes names every day. Yeah. yeah. Does it? Okay. But is it you good? Know, it's not just. And once that is actually rules. influencing the show, that's that's a yeah. huge deal. I mean, it it makes it so the entire thing comes back around and works. Um, and then you have this whole other model of, okay, cool. Here's something that I can in turn get a sponsorship for that's completely unique than just running the same 30 second spot or the same 60 second spot <laughs> over and over again. You know, we can actually do some pretty interesting things with it. So we have. Two more questions, okay. and so we're going to take our first here from Karen. Hi, I was, I'm particularly interested in podcasting for higher ed and, um, and integrating that interactivity with uh, instructors and students. Do you have any suggestions or tools or podcasts that you think would help instructors to integrate that into their, their pedagogy? I can give an example. Um, one of the shows, we, we do four shows right now on Intel Software Network TV. One of them is called Teach Parallel. It's about um, getting the, the, the fact that, you know, computers or processors are getting more and more cores rather than just getting faster, and how to teach that in a computer science curriculum. So one of our shows is, is it's an Intel person and it's a professor at a college in California, and they co-host the show, and that's the topic of the show. Um, so that's all the setup. What I think the example is, is since that teacher is a professor, it just so happened that the time slot that we do the show every week ended up being a time where he had a class full of CS students to teach. And so what he does on weeks where he has a show is has his students as part of their classroom exercise come participate in the chat of the show when we broadcast it. So when we're having, you know, we have a guest on and they're talking about you know, this kind of parallelism or whatever. He has his students in there asking questions and has kind of made that a part of the classroom. Um, so leverage that kind of interactivity and chat in, in an educational way. And I think, I, I don't know if it's a generational thing or, or if you can make that kind of generalization, but students probably have a better grasp on, um, you know, these internet technologies than Twitter and Facebook and chat and that kind of stuff than, um, than maybe the teachers do. So. Uh, Take advantage of that. Use that as much as you can and, and get them engaged in, in the ways that you're interacting. And we've got one more question. Marshall. Marshall. Hey. Hi, hi, Marshall. Marshall. Hi. Everyone say hi to Marshall. Hi, good morning. <laughs> um, so one of the things that, that I find most exciting about podcasting and all this new media stuff is uh, that it's, uh, in theory, democratizing publishing. Uh, that's one of the rules that it breaks. You don't have to be wealthy and part of a big established institution in order to publish content. And I, and I wonder if, if anybody could help point us towards places where we could do a, a check-in on just how that's going in the podcasting world, if it's really democratizing publishing of audio and video content. You know, I'd, I've been thinking, I'm sure people saw the stories in the newspaper about the PSU study that came out that said that Portland is a uniquely bad place for people of color in terms of unusually high uh, unemployment and, and what have you. So is the, I don't know if that's the Portland podcasting scene or it has any thoughts about, you know, is, is podcasting, is it democratizing uh, publishing beyond, you know, around things like class and race and gender and, uh, and power dynamics like that? And, and where could we go to, to check in on that more and learn more about how it's going? Does anyone? I have no idea. I'll take a swing at that, um, and that the, the technology gap between early adopters, middle adopters, and those totally left behind still is one of the things that really worries me, um, that you have a whole lot, a number of, of populations um, still whose only internet access is available when the library is open. Um, that to me is is very worrisome. There are some encouraging things there. Um, if something like Google TV ends up actually finally being the thing that brings uh, internet access and internet activity into the living room, that's, that's wonderful. But that's still uh, reception and not creation. It's not reception, not creation, but 
people need to receive before they even get inspired to create. True. Um, and, you know, they, a whole lot of the rest of the world just skipped over wired internet access and are moving right along to, to, to wireless for their, their primary access point. The U.S., simply because it's so big, that's much, much harder to do um, in this country. And I, I really worry that if you, you're left with lots of populations whose primary means of internet access is Facebook on their phone, um, that they really are left behind. And if, if that's their only means of creation, there's no bridge into the broader democratized, let's create for everyone. Um, and I think there probably need to be some, some solutions at the, the governmental level to ensure access for everyone uh, at an affordable level. Because right now, 60 bucks a month for, for a cable modem yeah. isn't feasible I would for, go ahead for a whole lot of the country. Yeah, I would venture a guess that, that podcasting is predominantly white men. Oh, yeah. I mean... Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Boo says white man. Says the white man in the, the audience. Um, <laughs> but I, I actually, I think that's a really, I'm going to try to look up some statistics a, on that and, and I'll tweet it out because Laurel, did, oh, you've got, okay, I'll have Laurel send me the information. So Laurel um, mentioned just for the stream yes, that, um, that the EFF is doing a lot of education and outreach, and uh, there's distance learning programs mm -hmm. um, to look at doing production through the iPhone, I think is what she said. That's, Marshall, that's a really good question. I'd like to think and hope that podcasting is democratizing the media and giving people access. Um, there was a program I worked with through the 4-H program called the Tech Wizards. Um, it was some folks I worked with at Intel, and actually I set up a site and did some, some classes and taught them how to podcast taught them how to use a recorder and do the audio production and how to publish it. And then their, their assignment, their class project was to go and produce a show. And some of them did, you know, just kind of interview their friends. But some of them went and, you know, talked to, these are high school age kids, went and talked to somebody who, you know, was, you know, was pregnant in high school and had all the, I mean, there were some pretty hard hitting things that came out of this. Um, so I think the best that, that we can do um, being kind of the you know the privileged people here is is remember that and and teach go out there and teach help kids learn how to podcast help kids learn how easy it is through the technology they have be it their cell phone or you know library access to the web um, you know help them know that there is a way to do that and I think that's a, a really good uh, call to action for all of us so, I, I'd love to see the tech community get more involved with groups like ethos mm -hmm, where yeah. you've got you know you've got people who are teaching kids music I think there's a, there's a, a natural dovetailing there into the, the pro podcasting broadcasting world as well, and I, I'd love to see some more some more outreach there. So we just have a couple moments left. So I just, just do you guys anyone have a, a kind of a final thought on on not just podcasting but online media? Robert, I think it'll get a lot bigger, but I think that goes without saying. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of time before it. I, uh, ultimately, I'd like to see all media distributed through the internet. I mean, I don't think that's very far away at all. No, I, I, and I think there are people who are kind of have their head in the sand about that, but I really think it's um, a lot closer than most people think as well. Well, it's morbid, but the people that have their head in the sand about that are, are a dying, uh, you know, they're they're a dying generation. I mean, right. it's gonna you, you don't have kids growing up going, oh no. We, no, we don't. We don't have to convince them they're dead. wrong. We just have to outlive them. Exactly. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Persistence. It's going to work. <laughs> it's all about the the revenue models and yeah. and where where the money goes in the next five years. For the moment, uh, unlike print, broadcast is still profitable and folks are making money. Um, if it looks like after the the mini, uh, mini depression, uh, that that revenue has stabilized for the moment. Mm -hmm. If it stays stable for the next five years, I don't think you're gonna see huge shifts. If the advertisers start to go away and really see a lot more uh, benefit advertising online and the traditional ad money goes away from, from broadcast, then I think you're gonna see a much faster shift and that, that's what I'm gonna be watching mm -hmm. for. And, and the thing I think about the future of podcasting it's the future of media. Mm -hmm. And media is never going to get harder to create, 
Hard drives are never going to get more expensive. Bandwidth is never going to get more expensive. It's never going to get harder for people to create media and to have their voice heard. It's only going to get easier. It's going to be harder to be heard, though. Well, there's going to be a lot more voices, and that's where I think the attention crash and, and you know, getting heard when there's a million channels to choose mm -hmm. from, that's a whole other problem. But the, I, I love the fact that everyone who wants a voice will hopefully be able to have a voice. That's the future of podcasting that I'd, I'd like to see. And that creates the big opportunity, which is curation. Yeah. Right. All right, well, we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to say goodbye now, but I w can everyone just go ahead and let everyone know where to follow them on Twitter? Alex? Alex Williams on Twitter. Uh, I'm A Weiss, or when I'm at work, I'm at The Square. I'm PDX Sucks. I'm J.A. Bancroft. I'm Cami Chaos. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you us. very much. Thank you. Thanks. All right, just to, let, just to let everybody know, we're gonna have another panel coming up here after the break, but during the break, there are some book sightings going on out in the lobby. And uh, bye. <laughs>